Hi, my name is Paul Lieberman. I have the privilege of introducing the leader of our panel. Uh, this is an important night. We're going to put to rest this ridiculous mythology that's popped up over the years surrounding this college, Williams College, which has told repeatedly the story of these men who played football or basketball for three or four years, took one art class senior year, and became head of this museum or that museum, and then gave themselves this name, the Mafia. End of that story, because we're going to tell a different story. That was a good one. That was a good story. Uh, as many of you know, if you're in a marriage, it's sometimes hard to find common ground on matters of artistic taste. For instance, who, what radio station do you play? My wife and I have one radio station we can play in common. We get in the car, and we each turn on our own. I go a little edgy, she goes a little sweet. <laughs> we do share one taste in paintings. We love Barbara Ernst Craig's paintings. We agree on that. We have two in our living room. Uh, Barbara, who's going to lead our panel tonight, usually is being introduced as an artist, which she is. And I think many of you know what she's done. But I'd like you to consider her for tonight as something of an art scholar. Uh, when Barbara was writing her senior thesis uh, at Williams College, uh, she did it under the tutelage of the great Lane Faison, and she wrote what became the first chapter of his book on Baroque art and architecture. So you may have heard the stories of his terrific students who became director of this museum and that museum. Barbara was the same way as a student, plus she could really paint, and we're not even talking about her divinity studies uh, that she did as well. So Barbara Ernst Prey is a marvel of brains and artistic talent, and we're going to turn the night over to her. Barbara? Thank you. Thank you. Can you all? Well, can you all hear me? Yes. Um, I wanted to say, first of all, this is exciting for me to be with these women. Um, they are the pacemakers of contemporary art and really some incredible women. Unfortunately, Shamim could not be with us tonight. She has a project um, glitch for something that's happening in um, January. So she, she sent her apologies and would love to be here and is with us in spirit. Um, I wanted to go to go first go around and introduce our panelists, and I'm going to go alphabetically. Darcy Alexander, right over there, um, graduated from Bates in 1988 and from the Williams College graduate program at the Clark in 1991. She is the chief curator of the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis. Darcy is responsible for bringing the Walker's multidisciplinary vision to life by overseeing programs and exhibitions, visual arts, design, performing arts and film and video, as well as the Minneapolis Sculpture Garden. Prior to the Walker Art Center, Darcy was a senior curator and department head of contemporary art at the Baltimore Museum of Art, where she focused on building the contemporary works on paper collections. She began her museum career as a photography curator, working first as assistant curator at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and I have the dates of 1998 to 2000s. Um, 95. 95, <laughs> um, Laura Halpin. Um, graduated from Williams in um, 1983. I have to say, Paul didn't say this, I graduated in 1979, so we share a lot of um, the same era and some of the same, a lot of the same faculty. Um, she is the Krauss Family Senior Curator at the New Museum. Previously, she was Curator of Contemporary Art at the Carnegie, Carnegie Museum of Art, where she organized the 54th Carnegie International Exhibition. She served as assistant curator in the Department of Drawings at the Museum of Modern Art from 1995 to 2001. As the curator of drawings at the Museum of Modern Art, she organized exhibitions including Drawing Now, Eight Propositions, 2002. She was a guest curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago from 1993 to 95 and began her career as curator at the Bronx Museum of the Arts and was there from 1987 to 1990. At the new museum, she team organized the opening exhibition, Unmonumental, 2007, and most recently, The Generational, Younger Than Jesus, 2009. In addition to catalogs accompanying her exhibitions, uh, Laura is the co-editor of Primary Documents, 
contemporary art in East Central Europe. She has written frequently for magazines in the US, Europe, and Asia. Um, and I have to say, when I was doing my research for all these panelists, it is amazing. I mean, um, what you've all done is uh, so admirational <laughs> and just um, so respected. Nancy Spector um, is a graduate from Sarah Lawrence in 1981 and the Williams Graduate Program in 1984, maybe right there. Um, she received her um, Master of Philosophy in Art History from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. She is Chief Curator of the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum, and I, I, um, I also want to say she's been at the Guggenheim since 1989. So that's 20 years. Actually, 84. A lot of this is from Google, so you don't have to. Give me power. Sorry. And Laura went to the Institute. I did. <laughs> um, she organized exhibits on conceptual photography, Matthew Barney's Crims, Crim, Crim, Cremaster. Oh, right, Cremaster Cycle, <laughs> and Richard Prince. She co-organized co moving pictures in singular form, sometimes repeated. She was one of the cu curators of Monument to Now, an exhibition of the, I'm, you're going to have to help me with Dacus Ioana. Jock, Dacus Ioana collection, which premiered in Athens as part of the Olympics program. Nancy was adjunct curator of the 1997 Dennis Biennial and co-organizer of the first Berlin Biennial in 1998. In 2007, she was the U.S. Commissioner for the Dennis Biennial. Under the auspices of the Deutsche Guggenheim Berlin, she has initi initiated special commissions and exhibitions. Nancy has contributed to numerous books on contemporary visual culture, and she is regu a regular columnist for Freeze Magazine. She is the recipient of the Peter Norton Family Foundation Curators Award. <coughs> <laughs> I wanted to start our conversation, a conversation, and I'll start with Darcy and go this way, um, to ask if you would briefly state the path which you have taken to get where you are and what your driving passions have been. And also, if you wanted to pull in what your Williams experience has been and influenced by your work. Is this one? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, well, uh, my path is uh, really one that, like a lot of people probably in this room, um, began like as a kid. And believe me, I'm not going to take you back to when I was a kid, I promise you. But for many of us, the passion for art really started in, child, in childhood and, and in adolescence. And um, it, it blossomed into an interest that took me to Williams. Um, and uh, we can talk a little more specifically about the Williams program and what it has to offer um, later on. But uh, after Williams, I, um, I had a two-year fellowship at Harvard um, where I really kind of got some you know, baseline curatorial experience. Uh, and um, following that, I, I, I got a job at, at the Museum of Modern Art as a, as a curatorial assistant, what really the, at, the, at the very bottom of the rung the lowest of the low in the, in the curatorial ranks um, at, at that institution in the photography department, which had been a kind of an inter area of interest of mine. Um, and gradually over, over the years sort of worked my way um, up uh, to the point where I was able to do exhibitions and really contribute to the photography program in, in some form. Um, and, and in 2000, a, a couple things happened. Um, there was uh, a strike at MoMA, which was um, kind of a, a for many of us who were employed there, a, a turning point. Um, some left, uh, some stayed, um, and are still there. I got pregnant, um, and <laughs> uh, uh, decided that it was, it was, it was a good, good time to move on, and, and God bless my, my boss down in Baltimore. She hired me nine months pregnant. Um, and I moved down to Baltimore in 2000, and, and again, you know, started uh, with, a, with an idea of, of sort of um, advancing the works on paper collection. At this point, I'd gone out of photography to look more drawing and, and works on paper more generally in the contemporary realm. But as you become more immersed in contemporary art, you realize that some of these medium distinctions that some of us began mm -hmm. with earlier in our career don't really apply as, as, as firmly um, in, in art since 1960. So, um, you know, my, my career really blossomed there. Um, and uh, while well, many of my, my peers wondered why I wanted to move to Baltimore, they'd seen The Wire and 
we don't we have a lot about John Waters. Um, it was actually a great a great moment of creative growth and 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 uh, and personal growth. I was able to kind of bring my life and my career uh, together um, in a way that, that really worked for me until I left uh, last year to, to go to the Walker Art Center. So that's kind of my my path. Yeah, sorry. Well, um, just figure out the right distance. <laughs> uh, I think actually my being a curator in the visual arts um, has been a very unlikely uh, result. Um, if I look back at the path my, my studies and my life had taken, I actually, in undergraduate, um, I went to college at Sarah Lawrence and I majored in dance and philosophy and um, applied to Williams, the Clark um, program at Williams College, which was willing to accept me with very little art history background, and it was such an amazing place to be because I had the benefit of the undergraduate program. So I took the, um, all of the master's degree classes, but also participated, sat in on the, the lectures, and got a crash course in art history. And while at Williams, I did a paper on Kandinsky, <coughs> which landed me an internship at the Guggenheim Museum in the summer of 1984 after I graduated, which turned into a, uh, a curatorial assistant job, and I'd be curious to vie with Darcy to see how low one could get, because <laughs> I remember sharpening pencils for a good part of it for my boss at the time. I was, I was an expert on switchboards and Xerox machines. Okay. We're, we might be even. <laughs> um, and I left for a while, uh, I went, to uh, Houston to work as a cur uh, assistant curator of contemporary art and um, a very brief interlude. And uh, Tom Krenz, who I knew from Williams, he was the head of the um, Williams College Museum of Art at the time, and I was his graduate student assistant, brought me back to Guggenheim in 1989. I was um, born and raised in Washington, D.C., where the museums are wonderful and free. And I went, to, I went to them frequently. I remember the opening of the Hirshhorn uh, Museum and Sculpture Garden very well. I wrote a review, <laughs> a very strong review, and very, I uh, argued very heavily against uh, contemporary art in the discourse, as I remember. <laughs> um, but so I, from, from youth, I really knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to uh, go to Williams College, and I moved to New York and go to the Institute of Fine Arts. And I feel very fortunate that I was able to do at least those three things. So uh, after Williams, um, the day I graduated, I moved to New York City, and I did. I remember packing up and taking the Peter Pan bus um, down to the East Coast. And, and um, what, 20, 29 years, 27 years later, or whatever it is, um, I'm here. I went to the Institute of Fine Arts, um, a place that I loved very, very much, and um, then got a job at the same time as Darcy at the Museum of Modern Art in the drawing department and um, as an assistant curator. And um, the Museum of Modern Art this, in the six years that I was there really afforded me a tremendous um, opportunity to work with the contemporary artists that I had gotten to know um, uh, during my time in New York, um, the few years that I was uh, in New York. During my graduate studies, I was the curator at the Bronx Museum of the Arts, if anybody's ever uh, been up there, it's on the Grand Concourse. Oh, yeah, it's a contemporary great. art museum, and um, by my calculation, in the two and a half years I worked there, I made 350 studio visits. So when I started at MoMA, I came really armed and dangerous, <laughs> especially for the projects program, and I had a great time for six years. Um, after which, um, I was uh, asked to do the Carnegie International, which is a um, the second oldest <laughs> uh, exhibition of its kind, the first being the Venice Biennale. It happens in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania at the Carnegie Museum of Art, a very fine institution with a wonderful collection that's um, very much focused on contemporary art from 1895 to the present. It took almost three years to do that exhibition, um, and I spent a lot of time in the air. Uh, and I traveled all over the world and then came home um, just when the new museum um, was about to open its new building on the Bowery, 235 Bowery, please come visit us. <laughs> And uh, joined the new the new museum as a senior curator there, and um, the rest is history. There's something else that I really want to that's important for me to say is that um, I've been to, I've worked in these very diverse institutions. I think from the Bronx Museum to the Museum of Modern Art to uh, the new museum, the Carnegie is, is much closer to the MoMA in, in, in its sort of makeup. Um, but what has been a consistent thing for me is the uh, the 
artists that I've worked with. There, is, there are two or three artists that I've worked with in every single venue, uh, from the Bronx Museum uh, all the way to the new museum. Um, I have, I'm lucky enough to have that uh, uh, lexicon, um, that vocabulary of contemporary art that started at the Bronx Museum, and which I'm still working with and writing about and thinking about today. Who are they? Mm -hmm. Nancy, I'm, I'm going to ask each one of you a specific question. Um, that's who those artists are. Oh, me? Yeah. Um, well, let's see. Um, I met Gabriela Orozco um, in an elevator at uh, 583 Broadway, this uh, gallery building. Um, and um, it was my first ex exhibition at the Bronx Museum of the Arts. Um, through him, um, I met um, a man, uh, an artist called Rick Richard and his wife, Elizabeth Payton. Those were the first two projects exhibitions that I did at the New Museum of Modern Art. Um, through them, um, well, actually, through Rick Ritt, I met an Italian guy named um, uh, Maurizio Catalan, who was the third project that I did at the Museum of Modern Art. He was also in the Carnegie International. When I um, got to uh, the new museum, the first exhibition that I did that somehow was not on my resume was a uh, mid-career retrospective uh, of the artist Elizabeth Payton, um, who I first worked with in 1988. Yikes. And it was the fourth time that I'd worked with Elizabeth, so it was a great pleasure to be able to do the mid-career retrospective of somebody that I'd grown up with. Mm -hmm. um, other artists that I've worked with more than three times, Jeremy Deller, a wonderful project mm -hmm. that happened at the New Museum, um, and Atoma Apps, another monographic show that I did at the New Museum. So that's the group. Mm -hmm. Nancy, would you tell us what your day-to-day, -day, people are always curious what a curator does, and, and besides going around the world, um, Managing sixteen other curators. Um, um, would you? Yeah, I wish I. And also to ask uh, Darcy and Laura to pipe in after what, what they do. Well, I wish I could say that I spend it all day at studios, <laughs> libraries, my desk writing. Um, let's see, my day starts dropping my daughters off at school, <laughs> and then uh, fourteen meetings. Um, as chief curator, of the, it's actually the foundation, uh, not the, the, the Guggenheim Museum, which means it's um, the, the flagship Guggenheim building in New York, but also our, our museums in Bilbao, Berlin, um, Venice, and soon to be Abu Dhabi. There's a lot of strict strategizing meetings with staff about collection building, uh, programming, policy, um, I don't know how it is at other museums, but the curators at the Guggenheim were actually quite small staff, so everyone's involved on every level. Uh, the actual the writing and thinking generally happens after my daughters go to bed at night. That was one of my questions yeah. down the line. <laughs> and I think as you scratch the surface and talk to most curators, it's increasingly becoming that. The ivory tower um, fiction is just that, that there's just so much day-to-day supervising and maintenance of the museum that the creative work is, it happens at other times, but it, that's not a complaint. I think you, you know, we're all passionate about what we do and you just carve out the time you need to do that kind of work. Darcy and Laura, what would you like? And you're um, from, Darcy, you have a multi, also a multidisciplinary description. Right. Um, I, I don't have to oversee multiple institutions. Um, I don't know what time you put your kids to bed, but <laughs> I hope it's really early. Um, no, it, the Walker has a, a various departments that I oversee. So there's a film and video department, an exhibitions program, a performing arts program, a design program, and so forth. So um, actually, a lot of my days is. is somewhat like, like Nancy's, kind of going meeting for meeting. Um, uh, our economic climate um, has made my job description a little different than it was when I started. And you, you I, did it just I, I started my job right after the crash, yeah. And, and, and I got a crash, <laughs> a crash course. Um, uh, you know, I think a lot about not just my projects and exhibitions that I that I want to do, but I, I think an awful lot about other people's projects and creating an environment where I can support uh, other young curators the way that I was supported. I mean, it, when I look back on my 
career there were key junctures where someone said ok i don't know if i agree with you but you can run with this idea and now i have the great privilege in a way of being able to say that to a new generation of of people and so like what i find interesting about being a curator is still about making exhibitions and having relationships with artists and writing books i really love making books it's like one thing i love to do but i also really love to uh give people um opportunity my, my situation is very different um, because it's a, i work at a very small institution a tiny institution and um, what our brief has been um, over the past two and a half years since we've been open is to um, rethink the wonderful identity of this very well-known American, uh, sorry, New York institution, the New Museum. So with our new building um, and a new staff, um, our job has been to create um, a new profile for the museum that um, incorporates the history as well as um, the future of the new museum. And that's been an interesting challenge. Decisions um, uh, are often made on group. Um, there are three uh, senior uh, curators and a director. And um, so it's a very collective kind of um, endeavor. And um, uh, since we have no permanent collection um, at this point, there is a small permanent collection at the new museum, but we don't collect right now. Um, our job is really uh, exhibition making, um, and that's been a, that's been an interesting thing for me because um, in previous institutions and jobs it's been very different. But so I'm sort of doing the pure D uh, curator stuff, and I just uh, spend time um, running around at my desk and with writing and reading and thinking. It's been that's been the really wonderful part of working in a. Kunsthalle rather than a collecting institution. There are the downsides to it, but I've given you the upside. That's interesting. <laughs> One of the things I, I have friends who are directors and curators, and I always love the curators because you love objects. And we talked earlier about working with artists, and I think um, artists also appreciate curators because they understand, uh, I guess, where they're coming from in their perspective and the right vocabulary. Uh, but I wanted to go back, because what, the question I was going to ask later, and, answered that a little bit, Laura, is you're doing so much, you wear so many hats, and um, I had told Laura I knew who she was long before I met her because I loved reading her writing, um, and I was familiar with her writing, and she was a good writer. Um, but, and you, Nancy, you had said you, you think after your children aren't in bed, but when, how do you um, fit in studio visits, and then also your writing, and your thinking, and, and your playing time? I get a lot done at airports. <laughs> I write on the plane. I write in trains. I like riding subways. Like those moments when you're suspended from your regular life, like people can't reach you. And that's nighttime, too. But um, it's challenging. I mean, uh, because what happens is that the back to back meetings do fill your brain and make you tired. And I think um, there's always a, a time of transitioning into the thinking process and the writing process that for me takes a bit of time and it always involves being with artists and reading a lot and not always reading art history. I, I read a lot of novels, I read poetry. And um, so I think that the, uh, you know, getting, getting to the to the to the point of dialogue with artists over a whole variety of topics, because of course the best artists are, are making art that that opens on to so many different languages and, and ideas. Um, is is always a place of, of great inspiration and creativity for me. But those moments become uh, more precious in a way as I advance professionally. So it's there's a kind of trait a push and pull between these different elements. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Um, <laughs> trying to get used to this. Uh, adding on to what Darcy was saying, I think as each of us advance in our careers, um, 
I'm now in a role where I'm doing much more nurturing of younger curatorial talent and spending a lot of time looking at other people's exhibition installation ideas and checklists mm -hmm. and catalog um, tables of contents and really digging into our program. I'm very selfish though when it comes to my own projects and have, um, luckily I'm able to staff them in such a way where I have people helping me, mm -hmm. where I can get to a place to clear the decks and do the thinking that I need to do. Um, in this past, I'd say 10 years, I've probably slept a lot less than I should. <laughs> But it's fine. I mean, the payoff are you know, amazing catalogs that we get to publish and to do exhibitions that are really meaningful. Um, and that fuels, I mean, that provides me with, with the energy. But it is really a balancing act. And I think with the economic situation, which I know you wanted to address at some point, resources are, are uh, scarce. The staff in all institutions have shrunk. Um, so it, it makes it that much harder. But everybody who I know working in this profession is really passionate about what they do. So it's 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 never a question of this too much or you know why am I having to do something that may not have immediate um, an immediate um, instance of how it's going to affect a project of you know my my own. Um, I think it's always looking at I'm always looking at the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Laura, um, your husband is an artist, and when he, and I'm going to also open this to, to both of you, um, how do you, do you get out to see a lot of um, other artists, and is that giving you a, a, an interesting perspective when you're working with artists? Well, one of the things that, oh no, I hate that. One of, one of the things that's uh, wonderful about this job, we have a great, we have great jobs. I'm sure that, I mean, I have a great job, I'm sure you don't, but. And because I get to look at art, and I get to be with artists, and I spent my entire adult life, um, first in graduate school, and then as a professional looking at art and being with artists. It's a narrow life, but if you believe, <laughs> it's true, but if you believe that it is significant beyond the contemporary art world, and in my case, because most of my career was in New York City, beyond New York City, that it has a significance, maybe in a small way, for a larger, for a larger idea of what what life and culture mean, then it's a really magnificent way to spend uh, your time. So um, artists are essential, and the art that they make are, all, are essential. I think um, something that might be interesting to, to point out is that as curators, um, part of a part depending on how high our, high up we are on the totem pole, there's a tremendous amount of infrastructural work that needs to happen. But in Maine our job as contemporary curators are to be the liaison between the artist and the institution. I so didn't think it was, I don't mean to speak for all of us, but I didn't think it was important, mm -hmm. more important than just hanging a picture or going to a party in Art Basel or hanging out with artists, and then it would, um, it would be less interesting. You know, as a, uh, I grew up with, my mother was uh, head of the design department at Pratt and taught there for 10 years, so I grew up in a very artistic, very artistic household, I mean, she painted, um, and I told Paul this, uh, when she had a party, she painted the trees in our backyard because she wanted it to be visually appealing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I painted our rug. I mean, it's, uh, but you, it's really something that, you're, it's something that you're born with and it's something that you're called to do. And um, you can't fight it. Don't you think? Um, I think it's a combination of things. Um, I also grew up in a quasi-artistic family. I mean not a family that went to museums a lot, but a family that made a lot of stuff. And fortunately, <laughs> early on in my career, I discovered that I was really bad at making stuff, but that I very much enjoyed looking. And um, I had some amazing uh, faculty, uh, teachers, mentors early on, who, um, as Laura, Laura was describing, uh, exposed me to the fact of arts essential role um, in life, not as a form of entertainment or as a commodity or as a fun topic to, to talk about at dinner parties, uh, where I spend a fair amount of my time these days, <laughs> but, but something truly essential. Um, and and um, artists um, enable us to get into the fabric of our, you know, 
this is going to sound really hokey, but our humanity in some profound way. Um, and uh, I still hold, hold those very idealistic values. And I think that the art that puts us in, in the greatest contact with, with those topics, those themes and moments and those personal experiences, uh, it's not always the most pleasant thing to look at. And it, it took me a while to understand that um, pleasure can come in many different forms when encountering art. And uh, I, uh, the, the thing that Laura was describing, which is this kind of sense of, of being in a really privileged position to be able to write about and have such close exposure to art, there's a lot of pleasure. Um, and, it, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it can be pleasure that takes its form in um, artists who actually bring us into direct contact with things we don't really want to think about that much. You know, so it, it, it's it's complicated, nuanced. Um, anyway, it's a bit of a digression, but well, when you're putting together an exhibit, I think it's, uh, people would be interested in this. How, from start to finish, um, you're often talking about a three, at least a three-year time period. Um, I'm going to ask Nancy that. Yeah. Um, and actually, could you elaborate on some of the things that go into it that we might not really know? Because there's so much having been sitting, having been on the other end of doing uh, international exhibits, and sure. uh, there's there's so much work that goes into it. I should preface it by saying that I tend to do exhibitions that are fairly radical and stretch the institution in a way that um, is very unexpected, and I look for that when I make my selections, um, whether it's just logistical or um, conceptual. It's, it's been very important for me to see myself, even though I've been there for so long, as um, kind of an interventionist and in introducing projects that will, um, as Darcy was saying, you know, speak about uh, social truths, political realities, um, things that people may not want to confront, uh, especially those who are um, out looking for a benign aesthetic experience. But in terms of making those shows, it, it can be anywhere from you know, nine months crazy trying to throw something together because there's a gap in the calendar to my Matthew Barney pre-master cycle took eight years of working because I offered Matthew the exhibition before the five part cycle was finished and I had the absolute luxury and privilege of being part of the process in a sense of being able to be on site on location for his filming and um, you know in the studio all the time and at the Guggenheim because there's um, we don't have a rapid turnover of shows. There's three major shows a year and a number of curators to fill those slots. Uh, we don't tend to have back-to-back -back exhibitions. And in some ways, it's almost a little bit opposite of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of studios. I think of it somehow as like serial monogamy with, um, you know, I worked with Felix gonzalez Torres for three or four years, Matthew Barney, then Richard Prince, and you know, now with Tina Segal in the midst of a project about to open. And having this, um, when, when there is that kind of time, there's an unbelievable privilege and honor to be that close to an artist and witness the working process. Um, and just in terms of the logistics, you know, we're very departmentalized in the museum in that once there's an idea broached and a checklist, then we have registrars who investigate moving the work. We have um, crews that look at the physical requirements of the show. Um, I mean, it's a many-step process. Yeah. That I think it might be a bit boring to go through it all, but start to finish. But I think the average person has no idea what really goes into putting on an exhibit from both ends of the spectrum, mm -hmm. from the artist as well as from the curator. Um, I also wanted to ask, both of you have done uh, curated by Indian. Well, the, the, the Carnegie's an occasional, it's not really a biennial. It happens every three or we four years. Yeah, right. for about 12 years, so we love the Carnegie, I have to say. And that, that was almost a three-year project of putting... It was, it was a, it was a three-year project, so, yeah. It, and that's a very different experience than doing a, a big research exhibition like 
um, the Felix Gonzalez Torres or your Franz West exhibition. I'm sorry. I was uh, doing a, a biennial is a very different experience than doing a, a monographic research project like the Craymaster Cycle or Darcy's recent exhibition that just closed at LACMA, the Franz West uh, uh, monographic exhibition. Um, but it has something to do with uh, group exhibitions like your um, exhibition, Darcy's exhibition in um, Baltimore, which traveled, it really had legs, it traveled everywhere. It was, I just don't remember the name of it, but it's slide a, the slideshow, right. And maybe, maybe you can, okay. So um, we asked generally about putting together an exhibition. So I'm assuming there are a fair number of art people here, but I'm gonna just kind of go through it really quick, okay? Is that okay, Barbara, to really, okay. okay. There are a variety of different kinds of exhibitions you can make. Um, there's the uh, sort of uh, biennial or generational model that Laura was making reference to. There's sort of the theme show, uh, and then there's the single person monograph. And these are all three very different beasts. Okay, with a monograph, you uh, all all projects can take any number of years. I mean, to do a major monograph usually takes between three and four years because there's a lot of time where you have to build up your relationship with that individual so that there's some mutual trust between the two of you or the three of you. Unless they're dead. Unless they're dead, which makes it a whole lot easier, but sometimes less interesting. <laughs> no, actually, you know, it, it, I mean, just having come off of this monograph, it is a real push and pull because. The story that you might, might want to give as the curator about the artist may not be the story that the artist wants told about themselves. So there's a constant, and it's, it's, it, it's the trust and the closeness of the relationship will, that will see those moments through. But those are you know, generally, those are sort of the pockets of exhibition types, and they may develop out of little kernels of ideas that um, maybe started years and years ago on a hunch or maybe on an article or on a conversation had that turn into research projects. The research projects become checklists. The checklists become exhibition proposals. Exhibition proposals become grant applications. Grant applications become the basis for funding. And over that course of time, those exhibitions, we hope, get legs. But some of them don't. And that's, um, that's another part of the, I mean, we've all had shows that we wanted to do that for one reason or another weren't right for the institution, were too expensive. Um, so that's a little 101. Nancy, would you tell us a little bit about um, the Guggenheim? We can't hear you. I'm yeah. sorry. Would you tell us a little bit about the Guggenheim in Abu Dhabi? No, you're not on. Nancy, would you tell us a little bit about the Guggenheim in Abu Dhabi? Sure. Um, as part of the Guggenheim's global network, we are in the process of planning and eventually building a Frank Gehry design museum in the Emirates of Abu Dhabi, which is being patronized by the government, which is essentially the royal family. And it's been a quite fascinating uh, process thus far in that it's um, the first time we're working in a truly other culture from our own, and it's providing a wonderful opportunity to really think about what it means when you say global or cultural exchange, and really are, are learning about a very burgeoning contemporary visual culture there, um, as well as the geopolitical uh, terrain that we're all trying to be educated about. Um, we're hiring staff from the region. We're hiring curators who are also working internationally. We're enlarging our team and our discourse, which is quite wonderful. Um, we're be, we'll be building a collection for that museum um, and really just thinking about it as what a museum of the 21st century ultimately can be if it is a collection that would reflect the globalization of art. And we're at, a, I think, a very privileged place to be able to um, theorize and speculate as to what that could be with a number of um, advisors and peers. And it's a, it, it, we do have the luxury in a way of we've been talking about it now for two years and beginning to actualize it. It will be a, a museum with programming that is of the late 20th and into the 21st century, um, completely internationally. 
This is the Contemporary Art Museum. We're saying that right now the collection will date from 65 to the present. It may go back to encompass ABEX as well. Um, and the programming will be largely of uh, 20th and 21st century, though with uh, Middle Eastern and Islamic art, we'll go back further because those, um, it's obviously very important to the region, and there aren't those cultural institutions that yet provide that, so we'll be doing that slowly. Are there going to be restrictions on the content? We've been told no, and we're moving forward with that assumption. I think it will be an iterative process. The people we are most um, closely dealing with, who are the kind of umbrella organization facilitating the project, um, they're all Western educated and very open minded, and I think that the, the powers that be understand the necessity to build an empathetic relationship with the rest of the world. And part of that will be done through cultural exchange and, and, and openness. However, we're not going to program our first show with Robert Maplethorpe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we do have the largest collection of his works in the world. But um, I think, as I said, it'll be an iterative process of introducing layers of um, kinds of work and educating as we go. We see it as much as education as as an art experience. The, the reason to the, well, I, the reason why I asked, I just want to add one thing there, is because I think we the new museum we when we at the new museum think a lot about the notion of the twenty first century museum. Um, there, of course, the museum itself is a is an enlightenment uh, manifestation, and the, in general, the kind of museum model that we see all over the United States and in Europe is a nineteenth century one. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting to try to the 19th century ideal of this uh, of, of this repository for great treasures into something that permeables the community at, at large. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges in contemporary art is, again, to um, not only to bring the artist's work in, but also to communicate uh, with the public what the artist is um, being the kind of intermediary between the artist and the public. And I think one of the super important things that uh, is to know about our job um, is that um, as much as we might have a passion for a particular kind of uh, particular kind of art or, or a particular artist, if, if we work at institutions which have um, responsibilities to our constituencies and responsibilities to our cities and also responsibilities to the greater art discourse, and all that goes into um, choosing the kind of work that we uh, uh, we choose to do. I mean, we all have passion projects, but they have to be passion projects with a purpose, or we would be um, we would be something else other than what we are. I think it's very important. So that a lot of things go into the decision making process when an exhibition gets a, uh, on the on the books at the Walker or at the Guggenheim or at the MoMA or even at the New Museum, the Little Old New Museum. A lot of things go into it first before they before they happen. And when you're considering that, I mean, it's you now get to the financial question. Um, in the, this economic situation, um, how has that affected your museum and also going forward? I'm on the National Council of the Arts and we, we went over the stimulus package for the museums and it's been fascinating to see what's going on in the United States um, and really the, the museums and the arts that need so much um, support. So we'll start okay. with you. Yeah, the economic, uh, it, 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 it um, of course, it's a very depressing fact because you know we're all losing money in some respect. Our endowments are down. The contributed income is down. Um, what that's done at the Walker is actually forced us to be more creative and really to look at those programs that are absolutely essential to who we are, and uh, and invent new programs that respond more directly to the to the reality of our of our climate. And I should say that the Walker, since it reopened in 2005, has used the model of the town square as a, um, as a rubric to uh, program around the Walker as a gathering place, as a catalyst. And I think that uh, continues to be very important on the community level. But the community reputation of the Walker is actually very different from its international reputation as an organization that does 
sort of very um, adventuresome curatorial programming and original scholarship. So we actually, like, like, like other peers, have multiple identities based on our geographic location um, and the specific community that, that we're working within, Minneapolis being a, a very distinct community from New York. It's a longer question than you answered. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I wish I could say we had a strong and healthy endowment, but um, that's not really the story at the Guggenheim. Um, I think the legacy of Tom Krenz has been a very brilliant strategy of forming uh, relationships with foreign governments and funders that provide licensing fees and support the institution through our affiliates, such as the Deutsche Guggenheim Berlin, which is funded by Deutsche Bank, um, and the government of Abu Dhabi, the government, um, the Basque government for Bilbao. And that really feeds into our operating budgets. And given the recent the crash last year, the museum really remains solvent through that. With our new director, Richard Armstrong, who has, comes from a more traditional um, fundraising background, he's combining it with uh, individual donor um, relationships and building the endowment. So it's quite, I think, quite healthy at this point to have dual uh, strategies in place. And everything from our development department looking at social networking and the success of the Obama campaign with grassroots mm -hmm. and really reaching out. Five dollars can make a difference. It doesn't just have to be the you know the big important name donor, but really it. As Darcy mentioned, community outreach. We are a museum in New York, and that's our primary constituency. But we're also global in how to facilitate both um, profiles. Again, the new museum is very different. We have no problem with our endowment because we don't have an endowment. <laughs> so, no, then that actually proved to be very lucky during the downturn. Um, <laughs> interestingly <laughs> enough. I heard that from another yes, interestingly director. enough. So, um, uh, we had to scale back slightly. We we grew in two years by, oh God, and I was not a math major, but we went from being um, a $2 million institution to an $11 million institution in two years. So that's a huge jump. So uh, we um, our staffing was something like 30-something when we were on Broadway in the 80s and the uh, all throughout the 90s. And when we opened, uh, we had a staff of 100. So it, we had a huge growth spurt, and then we did a little pulling back. So now we are um, um, about on par with other uh, institutional uh, um, pairing, which is between 15 and 20 percent. Isn't that correct? Mm -hmm. Of budgets, I think almost across the board, um, the museums in the United States have cut back. The lucky ones have cut back between 15 and 20 percent. And I agree with Darcy; it's helped us focus on the things that have been. Um, that are things that are very uh, important to us. But um, it's been a very interesting ride, and it continues because I think one thing that the new museum is finding finding now is that um, our approach, uh, our constituency's approach to the consuming of culture is changing. Um, we had a 10-year run where cultural consumption, specifically having to do with contemporary art, um, really changed. I mean, from we all worked or started working more than 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago. And in the 1990s, we had a little uh, economic recession as well, as you might remember. Mm -hmm. um, actually, 1983, when I graduated from Williams, that summer of 1983, the economic situation, the the, um, the unemployment rate was the same as it is right now. Mm -hmm. So I guess I lived through now. This will be my third one. But um, be, be that as be that as it may. Um, what was I going to say? I'm sorry, I'm distracted by the smoke. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, 50, we are. So, the most important. It has changed the. It has changed the way that people are consuming culture. There was an article in the newspaper today, um, in the New York Times front page article, um, that was saying that the uh, visitation in general at all museums in the United States is down. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm going to take um, a question from the back. It's, it's hard because the room goes back and I can't see the woman in the with the scarf. Yeah. You, you know. This is for all the panelists. Can you talk? Can you talk about how you're willing to take a that influenced your career and also whether you think it's influenced any different than Williams has had on the male market? Good question. Mm -hmm. I'm going to 
Chris because I was the undergraduate. Can I? <laughs> taking that privilege. Um, I had a very good grounding in art history in a very old-fashioned way at Williams. I, my professor for my 300 level course, that's the course you take for the art history major, was, and this is, it always deserves a drum roll, was H.W. Jansen. Can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> he had retired in Williams, in, in Williams Town. He was on his last legs, poor guy. He, he taught for one semester and then he, he passed on. But before he, uh, our, our, um, our course, um, was concentrated on some, one very specific thing, and that was um, the memorization of over 300 images from the history of art. As you know, Jansen is, was best known for a book called The History of Art, which I think is obsolete now. I don't think people use it. They, they still have it, right. But anyway, so we had to memorize every object in H.W. Jansen's History of Art. And I know that's a, it's a funny party story, but you know what? Um, it really has, did stand me in good stead at the at Institute of Fine Arts which was um, when Nancy and I were going there, it was not that different actually in terms of memorizing um, images and objects. And I felt that I had a very good art history education. And, uh, a very, I, I went into my graduate studies with a, a great vocabulary because of Williams. But one other thing I have to call somebody out, that is, is that I had a mentor um, at Williams and she's called Carol Offman. Mm -hmm. She's an Ang Scott, yes. um, a wonderful art historian, a great curator, and she, uh, when we were uh, privileged enough to get a curated exhibition from Carol, the last one was on Sarah Bernhardt at, um, at the Jewish Museum, and um, she taught me Italian. Uh -huh. So, um, and I have um, utmost respect for her scholarship, and um, I am enormously grateful to her. Could I, I might just add, as a, I'm also an undergrad, uh, and I was a Williams um, undergrad, and the, the, for me, I had the opportunity to work with Lane, and you know, I'll never forget, he gave himself an A plus, and he gave me, I think maybe an A minus, for working with him. Um, but he worked, my papers would be all read, uh, and he would just, he really worked with me to help me to, learn how to write. I think it helped me so much um, from the way, from looking at objects, from appreciating objects. I really, I would be working in art history if I was not a, um, a painter. And the vocabulary and also um, the appreciation um, for all of what you do, because I really understand what you do. And I have to say deadlines, that's been huge in, for me as a painter. And Darcy and Nancy, from your, from your experience as a, as a Clark, for me, it was the luxury of time. And the Clark Art Institute, is, it, it, at least it seemed at the time, like a retreat with the amazing library at that time. Did you have Zoom at all? We didn't have phones. <laughs> <laughs> um, we didn't even have electricity. <laughs> <laughs> but this is when Rila, the Getty funded project, oh, yeah. took up yeah. space at, um, at the Clark's. The library was amazing. And of course, there was the coursework, which was terrific. And I too was deeply inspired by Carol Hoffman. Um, I think, in a lot of ways, she directed me to revisionist art history and um, social social dimension of art history, which was woefully lacking at the institute when I um, went to the institute after the Clark. Uh, but it was that luxury of time. I mean, let's face it: there's not a lot to do in Williamstown but study. <laughs> Um, but I mean, I, I say that jokingly, but 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 I think that yeah, but I think that that what Nancy is describing is is um, the kind of seclusion combined with the extraordinary resources um, is extremely rare. Um, even as I subsequently went to have a fellowship at Harvard, I mean, the, the, the Clark, its library, the resources at Williams, its museum, Mass Mocha, I mean, created actually a more complete package for study. I would say. Um, almost. And uh, I think the, the other thing that, that I got um, out of my experience of, of Williams was um, I made some really good contacts. And, and um, I, I, I didn't have really an official mentor like Carol, um, but I was uh, worked closely with Linda Shearer at various times. And uh, when I was on the job market, Linda was on the horn um, with people uh, advocating for, for me um, and my projects, and uh, I met my husband there. You all have had very successful careers. You're right in the middle of them. What are your professional 
and personal aspirations for the future? Um, for myself, I think I just made a big shift um, into a position that has a lot more um, administration and programmatic oversight. Now, whether or not that directs me more towards a more of a directorial career path or a God, I just want to be go back to being a curator path. I can't really say right now, but um, I think you know the market is and, and our, our working environment has changed so dramatically in the past year that projecting into the future is, I think, quite a bit more challenging, um, both economically and programmatically. Yet it does seem to be a time to take risks somehow. <laughs> I want to complete my PhD. What would that be in? Yeah. I mean, at this point? Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually on Felix Gonzalez Torres. I have two chapters due. So it's a possibility. I would like to do it. Okay. It can be. Yeah. Yeah. Now my interns are professors. <laughs> I think an important, um, I don't know if I can answer that question, just because I'm going to skirt it. I think a very important issue for us and for the museum profession right now, and especially for women our age and at our rank, is whether we will make the leap to become directors or not. There's a tremendous pressure, and I'm looking at my colleague Lisa Korn, our, the wonderful director of the Williams College of Art Museum is here with us, and Lisa, you have 99.9% of your career as a curator, right? So actually, I'd be interested to hear, you know, how why you made the leap because many of us are, and especially at our time, our age, it's interesting that I know as many directors now as I do chief curators um, because there's a, a lack, right? There's a lack of um, knowledgeable, responsible um, people who have the skill set to be a director. Can I ask Lisa? Yeah. <laughs> I'm asking a question to the audience. Can you? <laughs> Come on. Hi. I really um, am deeply committed to women filling leadership roles in this profession, and I am very concerned that only 30% of the directors that make the museum actually are women still, and many of them will one day be 30% women. And so I think there's an absolute necessity that we demonstrate and be encouraged um, to be at the helm of institutions at a very, very complicated time in our history. And the second is, actually, I was afraid of becoming stale because, the, as, as you've heard from my um, very distinguished colleagues, you get on this treadmill of being a curator of contemporary art, and the demands are absolutely physically and mentally so exhausting, and they have been not whiners at all, which I really admire, but with all of the idealism that you have to um, find within yourself to keep you going, you have that constantly being challenged by these very, very real um, you know, pressures upon you. And so I, um, I wouldn't become a museum director just any place. I became a museum director at Williams because it was Williams College Museum of Art. It's the uh, connection to teaching and mentoring the next generation, and also the pressure that the students put on me and my ideas mm -hmm. um, keeps that fountain of idealism constantly moving forward. And it also gives me a sense, as I thought Darcy um, did just a beautiful job explaining, that sense of um, how important art really is to thinking about history and who we are as human beings. And I think that in a college museum environment, you know, we get to do that in a very concentrated way every day um, because of the kinds of interdisciplinary work that's going on, kinds of aspirations that our students bring to us, and also because they're very fresh, you know, they're young. Um, so I think for me it's a combination of feeling um, a commitment to my gender and the importance of uh, being a woman leader, but also um, the opportunity to mentor the next generation and sort of keep the faith and the commitment to the things that we as curators love so much alive. But I, can I ask a qu one little question? <laughs> and that is because I think it's really relevant. Um, because I am a, um, a teacher as much as I am still a curator, and that is where do we go from here with the education of the next generation? Because um, we're still providing, not only at Williams, but at other very, very good colleges, that strong art historical foundation. But I see a lot of my students and my interns here, 
and I have a whole, a whole nother crop coming up this year, and I'm asking myself, what is it going to take um, for them in order to be able to um, think about careers as curators, to think about careers as directors? What do we need to do to prepare them? Not just in terms of the art history they need to know, but other qualities and ways of thinking that they may need to have in order to, to, to do what we've done for so many years. I'd love to get your advice. Anybody want to yeah, I think um, this may be a slightly provocative uh, comment, um, but I think that um, one of the key ways that curating has changed over the years is a much more intensified relationship to this abstract concept, audience. An audience was always kind of um, put off as like the domain of the education people and of the PR people and the marketing people. But, but um, the idea of uh, curators um, producing exhibitions with a conscious awareness, I think, of where they land, the kind of impact they have beyond the individual scholarship that that particular curator can put forward. But again, thinking much more uh, uh, broadly about uh, the role that that artist's work is going to have on the institution and on the audience's experience of that institution is something that I think um, is starting to shift. And it was not something I was trained for. I had to learn that on the job. One comment, provocative too, also, I think. I think that being a curator is not a profession, it's a vocation. A vocation. A vocation and or a vocation if you want to be religious about it. <laughs> it's not, it's not, it, you don't go into it to make money. Absolutely. You don't go into it to Absolutely. go to parties. You don't go to, 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 to hang out with uh, artists. If you do, you're going to be disappointed. Yeah. Something else completely. And um, we could have a whole other discussion about curatorial studies programs versus art history programs, but I'm an old-fashioned advocate, old-fashioned artist. Me artists. too, me too. And I think that that is an important conversation to have yeah. because when I'm hiring staff and I'm looking at curators, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily uh, uh, pr privilege people that have had um, training in the trade. You can learn on the job how it's to be a curator. Science, right? it, it's not right? It's it's there's really some basic stuff, but, but basic foundational knowledge about art and some really good ideas is the, are the most important features that I look for um, in, in people kind of coming out of grad school. And that's why I tend to look more at the PhD, the academic PhD programs and the Williamses and, and not, you know, not as much. I and mean, we can talk a little bit about kind of the interface of Bard and Williams when it comes to contemporary art and the differences between those two programs, but um, I'm, I'm with you on that one. I think we have time if, uh, for one more question. I was told we should be out of here by eight. Am I correct? It's burning down. Okay. It's burning down. Um, <laughs> if you want me to point here. Yes. Yeah. It's so interesting the uh, process that you go through to um, locate particular works of art that you want to uh, be in the show. What process do you go through to locate particular works of art to be in your show? It really depends on what kind of exhibition it is that we're making. Uh, shows of um, you know, early 20th century or any further back, uh, works that are in private collections or museums, it's you know, basic research through uh, other exhibition catalogs and um, provenance records of other museums and such. Uh, with contemporary art, it's often uh, you know, working directly with the artist's gallery and getting a list of where the works are in the world. And it's also now, at least for, I think for all of our institutions, uh, we've moved more into production, which I think is incredibly important for museums to be considering today, in that we're actually commissioning and um, uh, funding new work to be made for exhibitions, and sometimes those works enter our collections. 
but with very, very contemporary shows, I'm seeing more and more of that, which is a whole other role of the career that we haven't discussed. You become a producer. Which you've done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think we all have as well. Last back there. So, yeah. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's such a continuous panel. I could ask so many questions about art, mm -hmm. but I wanted to ask just one about women in the arts. Um, a couple of days ago, there was a blog I read by Lisa Stravinsky, Real Queer Arts, and she talked about how uh, Richard Penstick has a new art prize and that most of the jury members are men, and she was upset about it. And I just wondered sort of how I turned down being on that jury. <laughs> so I really felt I had more important things to do here. Um, but how else would I answer that? I mean, I think what Lisa said was extremely to the point about um, leadership roles for women. And it's not a surprise that the three of us are here as curators, because at least at my institution, it's the majority of curators are women. I think you find um, women editors, women curators, uh, you know, the content providers, but not in the high paying jobs that carry the authority. And I think that there's, anyway, you, know, you wrote that thing to say. Well, not because both of our institutions are held by women. That's true, but it's in not your, it's, um, no, not anymore. Um, I think it's changing for the better, but I also think that there's the realities of being a museum director. I think most curators have to think more than twice about becoming a chief fundraiser. You do leave your creative work behind in many cases, unless it's a small enough Kunst Hall type place that you can also do the program. And I don't know how many women I know who are working as curators want to trade their artistic and creative freedom for a job that, of course, offers more money, but the rewards are, are less if that's your value system. And also, it's more to put forth from the object. And it's a different skill set. I don't think I could add no, I mean, but I wanted to say something about exhibition making and uh, contemporary art exhibition making and women, uh, women artists. And I think that it, we've really gone past the time um, where it is even an issue um, about, um, at least in, a, in, in my mind, um, that we need women to have, we, we need to reach parity, gender parity in our exhibition making, period. And that's a, that's a foremost, one of the foremost goals in, in my exhibition making, especially in my group exhibition making. Um, it's, it's very important. I, I think that um, uh, women have made a lot of inroads. We, we have a lot of creative power in our, um, in, in our field right now, but I still think that women artists need the support of, of curators, women curators particularly. From my experience, I would say. That's your name? Yes. <laughs> Let's see. Can you Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask you all about, uh, since you're all sort of contemporary artists, how you find young artists, particularly not so much in the U.S., but outside of the U.S., particularly in emerging markets in South America, India, China, and what, how that process works if these people aren't already ensconced in the whatever the established gallery systems are of those places. Yeah, I, I just participated in this uh, exhibition called Younger Than Jesus. Um, and Younger Than Jesus was a, an examination of 50 artists under. It just Actually, like <laughs> no, it wasn't. <laughs> um, under 33. Under 33, and I'm, yes, Jesus um, died uh, at the age of 33. So this was the reason for the uh, silly uh, title. Um, but anyway, so it was an artist of a very particular generation, actually, to get very serious, that the, the dem demographers have um, 
created a new generation that is from 33 years ago until 2009, so that's why uh, we started that way. Anyway, we had a gene pool of 500 Rs to choose from, and for that we chose 50. How we got that was through colleagues uh, all over the world, through the electronic media, through the internet. We did not travel, um, we didn't, uh, the, the time of sort of great big game hunting, going out looking <laughs> for the, you know, the original artist of Botswana or that is really Teddy Roosevelt. Well, it is, it is like Teddy Roosevelt, because yeah. what do I know about um, Kier Cook? You know, who, right, I, right. Well, we need to do, there are a lot, there are experts everywhere, so we rely on a network of, I think all of us do, mm -hmm. we rely on networks of experts throughout, um, throughout the world. And luckily, it's not necessarily through the commercial art markets, because the commercial art markets, despite globalization, have not necessarily reached to Yerevan yet, places like that. So um, we were working with uh, critics and scholars and curators.